Hello, and thank you for joining our session on climate, food, and agriculture. I am John Leonhardt, Director of the Abdul Latif Jamil Water and Food Systems Lab at MIT. JWAFS, as we are called, is MIT's central program on water and food systems research. We fund and coordinate research on water and food across all of MIT, including all five schools and more than 25 departments, labs, and centers. JWAF brings advanced research to bear on the human need for water and food in the face of rising populations on a changing planet. Our work is broad. It includes biotechnology, climate change mitigation, water purification, the sensing of bacteria in our food, supply chains, urban design, and the accessibility of water and food by dis disadvantaged communities across the US and the world. Next slide, please. JWAFS is especially concerned about the nexus of food and climate change. Agriculture and food production are responsible for 30% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions. Even if we could completely shut down fossil fuel emissions today, agricultural emissions would prevent us from meeting the targets of the Paris Accords. For that reason, curbing agricultural emissions should be about one third of all effort on climate change. Simply fixing energy systems will not be enough. The agricultural se sector is especially difficult because it consists of multiple challenges, deforestation, emissions due to livestock, digestion and manure, methane from rice paddies, and of course, emissions from food refrigeration and transportation. No single cause dominates, multiple difficult problems must be solved. My colleagues will now describe several efforts Jay Woffs is making in this area, starting with Professor Dave DeMarais. Dave, over to you. Thanks, John. My name is Dave DeMarais. I'm a plant biologist and a professor in civil and environmental engineering. My field of plant science is currently undergoing a generational transformation. With new technological developments in genomics and drone imaging, our field is effectively becoming data unlimited. We now regularly create massive data sets describing how plants behave in a range of environments. We also now have powerful new tools to manipulate plants. These include CRISPR genome editing and microbiome engineering, among many others. In spite of all these advances, we still have a long way to go before we can confidently provide humanity with nutritious, resilient crops grown both here in our agricultural heartland and in the regions of the world most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. To meet this challenge, my colleague Caroline Euler and I have been working to develop new experimental and computational approaches that combine our fundamental understanding of plant biology with modern data collection techniques to develop what we hope to be predictive models of how plants might respond to environmental change. We've been fortunate to be funded by JWAFS as we develop this project, which our immediate aim is to develop an approach to collect genomic and physiological data sets and then integrate these data using new statistical techniques that allow us to understand what cellular and molecular changes orchestrate plant responses to drought as just one exemplar of environmental stress that we're interested in. We have two longer term aims, two longer term aims of this project. The first is to identify the specific genes and pathways that we might manipulate, either using conventional breeding or biotechnology, to improve plant tolerance to drought and again, other kinds of stress. Our second long-term aim is to generalize this approach so that smaller scale plant breeders and biotechnologists might use statistical methods to design their experimental strategies, their breeding strategies across a range of crop species. I'd argue that maintaining agricultural productivity in the coming decades will require that we radically change how we breed and how we grow our plants. Increasing crop yield while simultaneously reducing agricultural emissions, which could lead to further climate change, is frankly an existential challenge for humanity. And we view our work funded by JWAFS as a first step towards sustaining food security under climate change. I'll now turn to my colleague, Dr. Afreen Siddiqui. Thank you so much, uh, David. Hello, everyone. My name is Afreen Siddiqui. I'm a research scientist in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics, and I focus on engineering systems. I'm working with Professor Olivier Debec on enhancing small farm sustainability. 
Our team is engaging with the challenge of finding economically viable solutions to reduce the environmental footprint of animal waste on small farms. Smallholder farmers are the majority of farmers worldwide. And most of these farms do not have systems that dispose animal waste in an environmentally safe manner. Animal waste, when not properly disposed of, can have several impacts on the environment. Manure runoff is a primary source of nitrogen and phosphorus in water channels, and their excess amounts leads to harmful algal blooms and can kill off fish. Uh, some types of manure management leads to release of methane and nitrous oxide that are greenhouse gases uh, that have high global warming potential. Given these impacts, some large farms have systems to manage livestock waste. However, current solutions are too expensive for use on small farms. So in this project that JVOS has funded, we're using new systems analytics to design solutions for smallholder farmers in poor communities. We are assessing recovery of biogas and nutrients, uh, along with monetized benefits of environmental protection. And we're specifically including payments for environmental services programs to assess how the cost benefit evaluation may be affected. We have started a collaboration with the partners in Southern Brazil to evaluate recent projects. Uh, since small farms, animal waste management will require cooperation within farming communities. Uh, we're using field interviews uh, and other data to examine social factors and incentives for farmers to participate in cooperatives. We are also studying factors incentivizing policymakers to promote sustainable programs. Overall, we aim to identify optimal combinations of technology, policies, and social participation factors to determine solutions that are viable and long lasting. Through this project, we hope to contribute to addressing the question of how to protect the environment as farmers engage in food production, how to improve livelihoods for those employed in food production, and how to do so for small and medium sized farms. Thank you. And uh, with this, I will hand off to my colleague, Greg Sixt. Thank you, Efreen. Um, hello, I'm Greg Sixt, Research Manager for Food and Climate Systems at JWAFS and lead for the Alliance for Food and Climate Systems Transformation. So a business as usual approach to managing our food systems risks sending us into a worldwide food crisis by the latter part of the century. Uh, as John said, at the same time, food systems are currently one of the key drivers of climate change, and without rapid and dramatic transformation, they'll actually accelerate our path to climate crisis. Such systems transformations require transdisciplinary solutions-oriented research, known as convergence research, to develop and implement effective and scalable solutions for making our food systems more resilient to climate change and actually help them reduce greenhouse gas emissions. However, currently, research is often not effectively connected to actionable pathways. Food and climate systems are highly complex and interdependent, but research often occurs in disciplinary silos where working across disciplines is difficult to achieve. Research priorities are often inadequately informed by the needs of policymakers, decision makers, and communities most impacted by climate change. And it can be difficult for stakeholders to apply research outcomes. And that's because dissemination of results is typically focused on academic audiences. And stakeholders can have difficulty translating this research for implementation. To tackle these challenges, JWAFS at MIT is launching the Alliance for Food and Climate Systems Transformation, a global consortium of 14 research institutions working with stakeholders to drive convergence research for action. Next slide, please. The Alliance will collaborate with stakeholders as key partners in developing priorities for convergence research and for aligning results with, implement, um, for aligning results with implementation of five key areas of work. First, we will bring together research and stakeholder communities from the governmental, nonprofit, NGO, farming and private sectors to identify knowledge gaps, high priority research needs and collaborative responses to them. Uh, we will carry out actionable research that integrates knowledge, methods and expertise across natural and social science disciplines. We'll assemble transdisciplinary teams to synthesize the state of the science to inform stakeholder action. We will identify strategies to overcome existing barriers to data access, dissemination and compatibility that hinder action. And we'll identify and recommend concrete interventions for action. JWAS at MIT is really well suited to be the convening force for the Alliance because we have a proven track record of working across, uh, working, uh, supporting transdisciplinary research and working across programs. We leverage MIT's convening power uh, to bring together international experts and stakeholders to drive innovation in food and climate systems. And also MIT's unique approach to problem solving and scaling solutions actually really enriches the approach that, that more traditional agricultural schools bring to this. So we really kind of round that, round that out in a really, really nice way. Uh, I'm out of time, so I want to thank you, and I'll return you to our moderator, John Leonhardt. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. 
Uh, we are now uh, ready to uh, begin taking questions. Uh, if you have questions, you can enter them into the uh, Q and A, uh, and uh, we will uh, then uh, pass them along uh, in my direction. So, first question I have here is uh, to Dave. Uh, question says: uh, The Green Revolution achieves substantial improvements in crop productivity through chemistry and irrigation. What will it take for today's advances in fundamental plant science and genetic engineering to make its impact on agricultural improvement? Yeah, well, it's, that's about the biggest question there is, right? So, you know, as, as the questioner certainly knows, you know, the, the big challenge, well, the big developments in the Green Revolution were, of course, fertilizer and breeding and then improved management. And that fertilizer part is going to be a tricky one as we move forward, because we know we can increase yields around the world by increasing fertilization. So there's parts of the world that effectively don't have access to modern fertilizer and technology. So we could just begin exporting more fertilizer, developing fertilizer in C2 and low those locations. But that creates a massive feedback on the climate system by creating additional greenhouse gases, both in the production of the fertilizer and then application to the fields. So yes, absolutely. I think plant biotechnology has a role to play here. I have a colleague here at MIT working in this area, thinking about how to make plants genetically, you know, use nitrogen more efficiently or even have better relationships with organisms that can fix nitrogen in the atmosphere. And I think it's that kind of really transformational biotechnology working in concert with you know, improved uh, farm management techniques to reduce nitrogen inputs and phosphorus inputs that we're going to have to pull off because we, we need more crops, but we can't do it at the same time that we're also expanding the climate footprint. Grand. I have a question to Efreen. Uh, this one is, uh, what is unique about the animal waste management challenges for smallholder farmers in particular, and what barriers do they face in incorporating sustainable strategies? No, thank you, John, for this. Uh, you know, this is really a fundamental question. There are solutions that are out there where, which large farms can deploy. So there is technology, particularly for biogas production that large farms are using. Uh, but when it comes to smallholder farmers with, you know, smaller number of animals, there are no cost effective solutions that are currently out there. Uh, the equipment is expensive. And ultimately what's needed is sort of cooperation of farmers. So one of the key things that has been explored is that how can farmers sort of get together in cooperatives uh, and then combine their waste streams uh, for resource recovery and for joint uh, sort of uh, addressing, jointly addressing these processes. So a key question and a key barrier is how do you get the critical level of participation of farmers within farming communities so that the projects are self-sustaining and long-lived? Uh, some pilot projects that were tried out, uh, initially there was farmer participation, but then it sort of trailed off over time and that has affected the sustainability of these projects. So a key question is how can we distribute sort of the benefits and costs so that there is enough incentive for all the stakeholders to stay in this and sort of continue in solutions that uh, address this issue over the long term. So that's one of the key focus that we're bringing in this project where we'll be looking at distribution of costs and benefits across all stakeholders and looking at the factors that incentivize farmer participation. And, and that leads uh, very naturally to a question that's for Greg. Uh, Greg, why is stakeholder involvement so important? for climate and food systems research? Uh, which stakeholders are most relevant and how will these collaborations work in practice? Uh, so stakeholder uh, engagement is really important because uh, you, need that, you need to know what the real problems on the ground are in order to conduct the correct research. Um, sometimes uh, as researchers, we can do what, what we're interested in and then try to find a market for it. Uh, when in fact, the, you know, to solve these wicked problems that we're seeing in our food systems, uh, it's really important to get to understand the challenges uh, on the ground and to understand it in a, in a systems context. So really, if you're looking at say fertilizer, right? To understand how that fits into the bigger supply chain and to understand where in a broader food system the barriers and opportunities are for, um, for, for research to have uh, a positive uh, impact. Um, what we're gonna do, so we're, you know, we're moving towards a launch this fall with what we're doing. Um, we are, uh, going to build off of what we did last summer, which is virtual engagements, bringing stakeholders from uh, groups that represent farmers all the way up to policymakers and, and international development organizations. Depending on what uh, a funder or a, a research project is looking at for geography, we will identify um, specific stakeholder groups to engage with, and then through a series of workshops, iterative workshops, iterative process, uh, find out what their needs are, and then identify which disciplines are 
important for, for addressing those challenges in which researchers and rich institutions in our alliance uh, can help answer those questions. Great. Um, another question to Dave. Um, given that sea level rise can lead to saltwater intrusion into coastal agricultural lands, uh, is anyone at MIT working on the development of crops that are more tolerant of uh, highly saline water? To my knowledge, no one at MIT is working directly in that area. I think there's a number of us, my group included, who are thinking about the kinds of experimental and pipeline approaches one might want to develop to tackle that kind of question. So, you know, I feel that our approach is very flexible about what particular stressor uh, we might want to target. And we, again, have colleagues who are doing, working in sort of areas in synthetic biology where one, one might imagine if we had a really good understanding of what some, some good targets could be for manipulating either conventionally or through biotech, that we could sort of pool our expertise to think about how to, how to go about achieving that. You know, what, what path would we wanna go in terms of you know, breeding targets or particular biotech interventions? So no one's directly working on salinity tolerance of plants, um, but I think we have the toolkit, or we'll soon have the toolkit one might want to try to tackle that in, in a crop of your choice. Wow, that's uh, gonna be neat. Uh, I have a question for Efrain. Um, do you model or measure the feedback between the warming boundary layer due to climate change and its effect on fresh water quality? Uh, do you think this is a factor in increased incidence of uh, HABs or harmful uh, aquatic uh, uh, blooms uh, versus uh, greater nutrient runoff driven by more intense precipitation events? No, that's uh, that's certainly a, an important and a fair question. Uh, you're absolutely right. You know, there are more harmful algal blooms being sort of reported, detected in freshwater bodies and lakes. Uh, and of course, you know, as we know, just from sort of basic uh, sort of uh, facts, you know, there's a lot of factors that come into play, including temperature, including the ambient temperature and, and many other factors. It's not just the nutrient loading uh, that contributes to harmful algal blooms. So, uh, so the answer is, short answer is no, we are not particularly modeling uh, sort of the chemistry, the biogeochemistry and the environmental impacts to model harmful algal blooms. Uh, it still serves as a motivating factor to sort of look at, you know, how do we uh, reduce the nutrient load, uh, modeling, you know, sort of uh, the issue of cyanobacteria and, and many other issues. That's a, that's a separate project, hopefully, that we can connect to. But in this specific project, we are really trying to look at um, how do we incentivize farmers to participate, but it's a valid question and, and one we'd be happy to take on um, in, in, in other future projects. So we have a, a, an open question here. Can you please share a few examples of research ventures research or ventures that brought to market uh, successfully some of the breakthrough technologies, uh, including in Africa. And maybe I'll, I'll take a stab at that one. First, uh, I'd like to mention a couple of things that JWAS has done in this area. Uh, we've supported uh, Professor Ahmed Ghanim and his student Kevin Kung to look at uh, converting uh, farm waste into fertilizer using low temperature torrefaction. And they've deployed that technology in Kenya they tested it in Africa and that's moving out to market. Um, another one that comes to mind uh, also in the food sector is work uh, being done that we funded by uh, Professor Tim Swagger uh, to detect bacteria on food. And they came up with a really simple optical technique of basically something you could put on a sample and it would either be clear or not clear and you would know whether or not you had uh, the presence of E. coli or Listeria. They've spun that out as a company called Zyva Systems. So there are a number of other things like that that have gone on. I, anybody wants to jump in, please do. I think you covered All that right. pretty well, John. <laughs> okay, sorry. It, it's, 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 I, I direct the program so these things are just <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's got all the insights. <laughs> uh, here's a question for Greg. Um, yeah. How can your alliance address regenerative agriculture that can pull uh, carbon out of the atmosphere and sequester it in the soil. Um, the massive removal of carbon from the atmosphere is possible through these techniques in a natural way. So uh, to Greg or Dave? Or... Um, I'll start Dave and you can chime in. Um, so, so part of that, part of doing that is, is understanding those, those systems dynamics better, right? So, um, so the kind of two parts of this, one is there, you are correct, there's a, enormous potential there and there's a lot of interest in that, uh, understandably so. But there's still a lot of unsettled science, right? Uh, soil, soil dynamics, soil uh, atmosphere interactions, soil plant interactions are extremely complex, and there's a lot we don't understand. Um, so, one is we can help answer those questions, uh, and and part of answering that is actually uh, the science that crosses those domains I just talked about. 
Uh, and then the second part is that through integrating the social science and through that some of that system scoping is you have to build programs that are sufficiently adaptable so as new science comes out um you you can you can well adapt it uh for i mean one of the key things here is farmers in particular are, are risk averse and so if you set up the program wrong or if you build it off of uh uh so it's not adaptable as new science comes out you risk poisoning the well so to speak um you know the risk averse pretty conservative on their on on, on you know getting involved in programs so you really do risk uh you know some great potential there so i think that's i hope and i want to give some space for dave on this too yeah thanks greg i think that's a that's a great overview of the, the challenge i mean you're right soils and plant soil interactions are one of the great unknowns right now i mean it's this is a critical area of research that really needs a lot of investment um i can think of a couple topics on campus in this general area so taylor perone has been funded through through jay wafts and he's looking at these um what we call anthrosols these are soils made in uh, the Amazon by people historically that are incredibly carbon rich. And so he's really interested in asking how were those made? How stable are they? They're really amazing soils and how nutrient and carbon rich they are. Now, could that be scaled? You know, that's sort of the open question. Um, and then my group is also interested in perennial agriculture. So we're, we're not, we're not working with JOS in this, but there's a number of efforts now in investing in trying to develop perennial grain crops, for example. And those are ones that might be able to sequester more carbon in their root in the rhizospheres and have a much more complex relationship with the soil microbes, um, the sort of the, you know, the, the bacteria and so forth that live in the soil. So that's a potentially another avenue of, of sequestering carbon. It's, it's a huge question. Everyone's very excited in this really big area. There's a lot of resources heading that way uh, from the federal government and from private sector. Yeah. Well, we're coming close to the end of our time here. I uh, want to, first of all, thank all of our panelists and I want to thank uh, everyone who's uh, uh, dropped in to chat with us. I know we couldn't touch all the questions, but uh, uh, please explore JWAS website. You'll learn a lot more about the kinds of things that we've been funding and doing. Um, MIT doesn't have a formal department of food and nutrition anymore. Uh, and part of JWAF's role at MIT is to reach across the Institute and find the people who are working on these problems, which are all multidisciplinary, all systems oriented, and bring this together to make MIT a key player in food, agriculture, and climate.